Bordeaux, arguably the most famous wine region in the world, and the home of blended wine, creating complex flavours by bringing together different grapes and using oak ageing to, as they would say, elevate the wine to new levels. With the name comes images of stunning chateau, crazy prices, billionaire collectors and perhaps more rules than you can shake a baguette at. Caroline had the privilege of visiting Chateau Mouton Rothschild and meeting the Baroness back in 2004. The settings, the wines, the food, it really was royalty level stuff. But what about the rest of us, the normal wine lovers? Do we have to know everything about Bordeaux? A few years ago, blending became a bit of a dirty word. Places like Burgundy were all about purity, about terroir, the individual vineyard, the microclimate, the soil, the smaller and rarer the plot, the better. Bordeaux was all about winemaking, which was seen as less pure somehow, maybe less honest. Additionally, Bordeaux blends became available from all around the world. While they offered approachable deliciousness, Bordeaux preferred to offer exclusivity. It was, dare we say it, a little bit snobby. If you turn up to your favourite chateau, you would be greeted by a closed door and a firm no if you wanted to know more, let alone if you wanted to taste some wine. And if you're not already a well-known buyer, many places simply refuse to acknowledge you. Napa it is not. It's therefore a region that conjures up equal amounts of frustration and delight. It has rules that make literally no sense. Wines you have to leave for 20 years, austere, unapproachable styles. Prices that are too high to open that bottle on anything other than the most incredible occasion. So it is no surprise that we've increasingly sought alternatives, especially ones that don't need us to have a PhD to read the label. And yes, while keen wine lovers might know that left bank means Cabernet heavy blends and right bank means Merlot heavy blends, trying to keep a track of all the different producers, villages, satellite villages, let alone the vintages, requires a serious love of the region. And so we have come to take the name Bordeaux slightly for granted in recent years. There are just so many easier wines to pick, where you know you'll find something good in a similar style to the better Bordeaux blends, whether it's from Stellenbosch or Napa. But the times they are are changing. While the high-end wines go from one record to another, much of the rest has been struggling and is now seeking to reinvent itself. So tonight, we wanted to give this region another chance, and to go into what makes one area different to the others, and to find where you still can discover value away from the top names that the collectors seek. And the first point, and it's very relevant, given what's in your glass now, is it's not just red wines made here, but excellent white and dessert wines, including of course the world famous Sautel. The name Bordeaux also means just so much more than wine that happens to be made near this city, as beautiful as the UNESCO listed city is. Bordeaux's successes all come from a complex set of factors that come together. Firstly, its location in the southwest, right on the edge of France near the Atlantic. It has a wide river delta set back from the ocean and sheltered from the worst weather. This made it a sensational port for trading, and being able to export and sell wines around the world was at the heart of Bordeaux's wealth. England also shares a key part in Bordeaux's history. We started importing their wines in the 12th century after Henry II took control of the region by marrying Helena of Aquitaine. And it first became famous for its sweet white wines, which had a prestigious clientele, including US President Jefferson. There was also a deep coloured rosé popular in the 1700s, particularly with the English called Claret, hence the name Claret that we use for Bordeaux wines. Another factor is all the wealthy families who owned the chateau and wine estates. How entrenched these were in the world's aristocracy led to a completely different focus to much of the rest of the wine world. Next is the Place de Bordeaux, which is one of the world's oldest marketplaces. Through this, the vast majority of Bordeaux wine is sold, and it is an astonishing multi-layered system that ensures there are a huge number of people across the world with a vested interest in spreading Bordeaux all around the world. Growers sell to winemakers who are introduced via paid courtiers to négociants who buy the wine, occasionally blend it themselves. And then if the wine's going out the country, for example to the US, it may need to pay an exporter to sell to an importer, who sells to a wholesaler, who sells to a retailer, who finally sells to you. Really? That is a lot of middlemen to take a cut, but it does somehow work. And you can tell because premium wines from all around the world now go through this system of buyers, not just the ones from Bordeaux. And the key part of this is the imprimeur system, where wine is sold just after it's made, but long before it's ready to drink. Professional tasters try barrel samples and attempt to deduce how good the wine will be, so hopefully by buying it young, you can find a bargain. And of course, another part of Bordeaux's mystery is the infamous classification systems. 
1855 classification under Napoleon being the most well known, but then in the mid 1900s, Grave and Saint Emilion came up with their own. The later survived with some controversy, and then there was the definition of cru bourgeois and cru artisanal, which attempted to give some of the non classified winemakers their own way of shouting about making good wine, and of course the split between Bordeaux and Bordeaux supérieur. Finally, there are the regions, villages, and rivers, and for that, let's make Caroline happy and bring up a map. So Bordeaux covers around 60 miles around the city of the same name, and of course it's home to the biggest estuary in Europe along three rivers, the Gironde, the Garonne, and the Dordogne. These affect the climate and are a huge part of why the wines have achieved world dominance. More about that later. The region produces, on average, 486 million litres of wine each year, that's 650 million bottles, and that is nearly 2% of all the wine made in the whole world. Only a minuscule part of that is from the top estates. Now, most people think of Bordeaux as three key regions the left bank, the right bank, and the bit in between. The left bank is famous for very gravelly soils, and it's also closer to the Atlantic Ocean. That is very important for Cabernet Sauvignon. The gravel retains the heat from the sun for longer, meaning that the thicker skinned grapes properly ripen, but the cool air comes in at night to preserve the acidity. However, go inland just past the city and you find the area of Graves. On the right, where the vineyards are much further away from the cooling influence of the Atlantic, clay and limestone, and this helps grapes like Merlot keep cool and watered so they can retain their backbone of acidity and not over-ripen. Further inland, the river splits to form the entre deux mer region, which translates as between two seas, and this sits between the Garonne and the Dordogne. Beyond this are the famous villages, names like saint emilion Margot, Payac, Pomerol, and all of these have their own rules. And then there are satellite villages, such as montagne saint emilion and Lalande Pomerol, which are very close to the famous ones, not quite as prestigious, but often similar in the wine style and the terroir, so potentially offer better value to the drinker. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, the price of the really famous wines. Why is Bordeaux so expensive? Well, aside from the supply and demand question, there are a few factors. Firstly, land. To buy a vineyard in one of the famous villages is ludicrously expensive. In 2017, the average price for a hectare of vineyard land in France was 140,000 euros. But in Payac, it was 2 million euros. Next to that, while we hear of the 10,000 pound bottles of Cheval Blanc, more than 70% of all the wine made in Bordeaux is sold for between 3 and 15 euros, so it is not all expensive. With an increasing focus on organic and sustainable production, plus all of those middlemen to pay, that makes life very hard for the growers. Last year alone, the average price paid for bulk Bordeaux by Negociants was between 500 and 750 euros per 900 litres, which is as little as 64 pence for a bottle's worth of wine. And that's all very well, but it cost more than 1,400 euros to make the same amount, which is nearly three times as much. In many cases, it would be better to just have the wine distilled to make industrial alcohol. And all of that is before the impact of extreme weather events like hail, which have hit Bordeaux really hard in recent years. To justify all that and stay afloat, the wineries must ensure their high-end wines pay their way. All of this brings us to the climate, and as it starts getting hotter, the traditional grapes start to struggle. They generate too much sugar, they lose too much acidity. Until 2019, red wines from Bordeaux were only allowed to use Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc and Carmenere. In 2019, faced with so much heat and the prospects of more change, the Bordelais decided to permit the use of a maximum of 10% of some new grape varieties. These include Touriga Nationale and Marcelin. White wines were predominantly Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, but there were some others allowed, such as Sauvignon Gris, Muscadel, Uni Blanc, Colombalp, Merlot Blanc, Ondon, and Mozac. After 2019, they were allowed to also use a maximum of 10% of grapes like Albarino and Petit Manse. But even without these new grapes, there are plenty of things that the growers can do to adapt. More and more people are using the less common grapes that we now see commonly in South America, like Malbec and Carmenere. These can maintain acidity, but they can also be a bit more clever in the vineyard, shading the grapes with the canopy, and even reducing the number of leaves so the vine has less power to make sugar. In extreme years, they can even spray the vine with natural clay to basically put sunscreen on the vine. So for all the dramatic headlines, there is still a lot of room to preserve the Bordeaux that we know today. Since we're drinking one, let's go back to white wines. Now, Bordeaux is the historical home of Sauvignon Blanc, but when you go for a glass of Sauve B, do you reach for Bordeaux? Mm, no, I didn't think so. 
and for years, White Bordeaux made no mention whatsoever on the front label of its grapes. It was simple, this is a Bordeaux Blanc. So dry white wines are made throughout the entire region, the most famous are from Graves on the left bank and the region between that and the Dordogne known as the Entre deux Mers, or between two seas. The more premium examples use oak, which creates a vastly different wine to the cool fermented stainless steel wines of Marlborough, which we now think of as today's spiritual home of Sauvignon Blanc. But it's no surprise that the French have looked to New Zealand jealous of its success with their grape. And this is where Wine One's winemaker cut his teeth. So it's no surprise that the wine we're tasting tonight has a tad more in common with those wines. But it does still have a decent amount of semi on it, which adds body and richness. Chateau des Antonins is a historical estate formerly owned by monks who lived there for more than 500 years. So are we tasting something of that centuries old historical lineage, or something like a New Zealand wine, or something completely different? Let's go back to the studio to find out.